Even you're a PhD student, $20 can be a week's worth of groceries, or, well, ramen, or one AI tool subscription. Most of the time I'd say keep the groceries, keep that belly full, but there are a few AI tools that are so good, they'll save you weeks of work, get you better results, and are absolutely worth the money. Today I'm going to show you the ones I'd actually spend my last $20 on. Depending on what stage of your PhD you're actually in, the AI tools you'll use and get value from will be completely different. If you're in the writing stage, for example, you'll want tools that make drafting and editing faster. And if you're in the early, like, exploratory stage of research, you'll want tools that can help you find and understand the literature. But here is my biggest money-saving hack. You can be a little bit cheeky about it. Don't subscribe to all of the tools at once. Instead, time your subscriptions to when you're actually going to use them the most. If you're not using it regularly, there are often free versions and free tools that are just as good. That way, you're only paying for when you're actually getting maximum value from those tools. When you're starting your PhD, the hardest thing isn't running experiments, it's actually just figuring out what's already been done. The literature can feel like a massive bottomless pit, and that's where SciSpace becomes your best friend. It's like having a research assistant who can instantly explain complex papers, point you to the right studies, and also even help you see the connections between other papers that you'd otherwise miss. And it does so much more. So. Let's check it out. So this is SciSpace. SciSpace looks like this, an AI assistant to automate everyday research tasks. Yes, we love that. And uh, you can see it does so much more than just fine literature. You've got all of this stuff down here as well. But really, if you are first starting out in your PhD or any research field, I'd highly recommend getting a subscription to this because you can just sort of like find all of the literature you want to find. So here we are. I've asked the most efficient OPV devices, and you can see it's starting a comp comprehensive research on blah 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 and it will go away and find all of that stuff. Look, this is what it kicked out, look at this. Too long didn't read the most efficient OPV devices currently, blah blah blah. Key breakthroughs include all of that and you can see the agent is running and it's finding me all the important information about my research field and the question I asked. So yeah, it's really great uh, size space. It uh, gets better and better. These are all real references, you can click them. Um, there we are, let's click there and go actually find this one. You can go out, find the actual papers, yeah, exploratory phase, early stage, um, finding literature, summarizing papers. You also get my library where you can save all of these files um, and you can also upload your own papers if they're there. Um, it's just a really great tool for finding literature, summarizing it, giving you a very quick snapshot of what each individual paper is saying. Like for example, here you can add columns based here on what you want to know about particular studies and papers. SciSpace would be the first thing I subscribe to if I was doing my PhD or looking for that like little research assistant to help me. Go check it out for your research field. Once you've got a handle on the literature, the next challenge is turning all of that knowledge and your results, if you've got any, into clear and compelling writing. And that's where the right AI tools can save you hours. And in the next section, I'm going to show you my favorites for drafting and editing. Now with drafting and editing, the perfect AI tool really depends on your own style and workflow. And in a minute, I'll show you the ROM prompt I keep on coming back to over and over again in my favorite tool. Now, I've personally had the best results with just general large language models like ChatGPT and Claude. They're flexible, they can adapt to your tone, and they fit neatly into my preferred like writing process. But they're also purpose-built auto writers like Jenny and Yomu. Um, that just work well, but I've never really got to grips with their workflows and been able to implement it for myself. So here's how I use large language models to make writing faster without kind of like sounding too generic and a couple of ways that you might want to use them. So head over to your favorite large language model, mine's ChatGPT for writing, and there's one thing I like to do for writing. I go down here more and I go Canvas. Canvas allows me to work with the stuff it's already generated rather than like regenerating it every single time when I want to change something. But there's a three-step process I use for writing with AI tools, and the first step of that is actually sort of like providing it with a scaffold or structures or something I want it to kind of emulate. The first thing you got to know about large language models is they're based 
based on like a base model. That base model doesn't include anything about your research, by the way. So you're gonna have to give it some examples about the sorts of writing that you want it to produce. So I've got an abstract here from one of my papers and I can say, use this as a scaffold um, for, you know, creating a, an abstract for something else. That way you can make it sound like your sort of like own papers or you can make it sound like the best papers in a certain journal if you're trying to copy those or get inspiration from those. That's the proper word, isn't it? So here I, I use this all the time. I say, read this and say read when done. And then I copy it in and then it says, okay, I've read it. Red, nice, <laughs> there we are. And now we're in the canvas layout and then I can write something here or I can ask it to do something. So I've asked it to give me the scaffold for this um, OPV abstract. And you can see here, now I can use this create to create my own writing, use it as like a basis. And then I can also just put in my own paper and say, hey, based on this scaffold, create writing like this. And then I go backwards and forwards. I really like this method of working with it. Um, it does sort of like allow you to uh, keep it on track a little bit more in the past you know it can be a little bit uh scattered in the way it produces stuff but if you give it examples you prompt it the right way and then you sort of like continually edit it and go backwards and forwards in this canvas panel i think that is one of the best ways to write for academia and research at the moment now there are also more advanced agent like tools coming out things like GenSpark. you can take a set of figures for example and generate a full paper draft i've tested them and yes it's absolutely crazy um, um, but that's not something you're actually allowed to use in academic publishing right now. So this is what it looks like. So here we go. I've got some sort of like figures up here. I've got all of these. And down here I've said, use these figures to create a story structure for a peer reviewed paper submission. And then it created a nice little outline. And I'm like, yeah, this outline is great. Give me more. And then I just literally say, create a paper draft, create a paper draft. Four words, that's all it took. And this is what it produced. I was actually really, really impressed. So down here, it went away. It thought for a bit. It gave me the full paper draft and here it is. It's got an abstract. It's got an introduction. It's referenced. We've got materials and methods. It's got the figures in there. It's got the captions. It's got everything I would want to sort of like start using if I was creating a paper draft. It is so easy. But the problem is you can't do this because these done for you, the thing that I'm calling like the done for you, put that in quotations, done for you work really means that, uh, you know, it's removed moving a lot of the actual decision making from the researcher and that's something that generally people aren't comfortable with at the moment. Hmm. Still, I think it's a clear glimpse of where the world is heading with AI tools, and I think we need to be ready for that shift. So, for the moment, I stick with tools that work within rules, but, uh, you know, you can take those figures and turn them into a paper. And uh, yeah, that's just crazy to me. It will be the future, mark my words. Once you've got a draft you're actually happy with, the real test is like getting feedback. And if you've ever waited weeks or even months for your supervisor's comments, you'll know how frustrating that can be. That's why I think Thesify AI is worth every cent. It's like having a supervisor on call 24 seven. It will highlight unclear arguments, point out where your logic doesn't flow, and even suggest ways to make your writing even better. The feedback feels human. It's not like robotic and AI like, and it's specific enough to act on immediately. So I recommend you head over to this and check it out. So this is Thesify, here it is. Here's Theo the cat, meow, hello Theo. So the great thing about Thesify is you can actually head over and get real kind of uh, feedback on your papers. So this is what it looks like, but I put in one of my papers. Here it is, Accurate Thickness Measurement of Graphene. It's my most cited paper. Thanks very much, Dr. Cameron Shearer for even including me on this paper. But you can see on this side, we've got all of these things. Feedback summary, title and abstract, introduction, suggested topics, purpose down here. You can see that I say, that I meant to say this. Have I met it? Yes, I've met it. What about this? The scientific paper must establish a protocol. Oh, I've only partially met that. That's a place where I can improve. And you also get all of these other things. Title and abstract has not been evaluated. I can compute it. Um, you get all of the different feedbacks. Thesis statement, you can see that no, it doesn't pass the so what test. The thesis statement does not pass the so what. So that means someone that's like reading this and they go, well, why is this important? That tells me I should spend a little bit more time really fleshing out why this is important for a real world situation. Um, and yeah, 
Thesify does much more. You get a digest up here. You get opportunities, which I really like, which is like further um, work that you could be doing. You get resources where you can have a look at publications where you may want to publish it. You get journals where you may want to publish it. You get conferences where you may want to go and sort of like talk to academics about this work. There's so many things and also grants. Oh, I love this. Grants match was never completed against your documents because it was old, but it does that for you now. I absolutely love it. It's relatively inexpensive. And if you're in the publishing sort of like stage of uh, your research process, this is a really great tool and worth every cent. There is no doubt in my mind that AI is going to keep on taking over more and more of the academic grunt work. So your job is to focus on the parts that can't be outsourced. And that is the creativity. AI can mimic creativity, but end of the day, it's a predictive engine. It's always looking for the most statistically likely next thing. To that means the real breakthroughs, the unexpected leaps, and the challenging of assumptions are still going to have to come from researchers. And that's where science will need us to stay deeply involved. Everything else, stuff you don't like, hand it over to the right AI tools. So I say to you, figure out the task you dread the most, pick the tool that's worth the money, and make your PhD or your research a whole lot easier. That's how you get more done with less stress. And that's why these are the AI tools worth paying for. If you like this video, go check out this one where I talk about the free AI tools every academic should be using.